So welcome back, everyone, to Behind the Shield. So this is a monthly gathering of cybersecurity professionals and enthusiasts discussing the industry's hot topics and current events. My name is Marco Estrella, and I'm going to be today's host. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. I just want everybody to know that if you're listening for the first time, that Behind the Shield is not a sales pitch. You're not going to be brainwashed in any way. But there's no sales agenda attached to the event. So we're just hoping that uh, you have a, um, a real open discussion and a relaxed environment where you can ask questions to cybersecurity specialists. So that's what we're hoping uh, will happen so that we get to see you uh, by presenting you with quality content and we get to see you in future episodes of Behind the Shield. Uh, we also love hearing from you all. So after the show, uh, let us know your thoughts. And in the follow-up survey, feel free to suggest topics for next month's episode. I also would like to mention that you can find more information on Behind the Shield on our webpage, virtualguardian.com slash event. And you can find links to past episodes that have been turned into podcasts. We are, that's right, we're now podcasts. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Alexa, iHeartRadio, and others. So look for us there. The agenda of the show is quite simple. It, we start off with a 30-minute current event discussion, and we follow that with a 15-minute spotlight talk, and we finish it off with a 15-minute question and answer with you, the audience. You can submit your questions throughout the episode. And I'll try to get to as many questions as I can uh, during the show and at the end. So let's get started. Let's jump into the hot topics uh, segment of the show. And today's hot topic panelists are in the red corner. We have uh, my colleague Christos Simotas, uh, Virtual Guardian's offensive security team leader. Christos has been practicing offensive security for more than a decade and has even managed to be elected on the EC Council Wall of Fame. Hey, Christos. In the blue corner, one of the co-founders of Navilogic, we have Bill Strew. Navilogic, a virtual guardian company, along with their fantastic partners, defend against the likes of Christos. Yeah. And to keep... <laughs> I got <yeah>, Bill. <laughs> And uh, to keep everything... We do our best. We do our best. Christos is pretty good. So <laughs> yeah. I think we can still, we can still stop him. <laughs> and to keep everybody civil, um, uh, we're happy to welcome guest panelist and spotlight speaker, Tim Chase, field CISO for Lacework. You won't want to miss his spotlight uh, talk in about 30 minutes. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. So let's get started. Um, in um, there's a, a specific breach that I want to start the show off with. Uh, with uh, it was the Twilio breach. Uh, in uh, it was about ten days ago, um, and there was a malicious actor who accessed data of about 125 Twilio customers. Now, Twilio to me personally wasn't um, it wasn't that familiar. The name didn't ring a bell too much, but I saw that it had a link um, when it came out into uh, it became public when Signal uh, came out and uh, talked about the breach because they were affected. So the breach started off with uh, the phishing of multiple employees uh, at Twilio. And then Signal mentioned that they had upwards of 2,000 users affected by this breach. So Christos, can you um, just give us a little bit of the details, what happened and, uh, and, uh, and the link between the Twilio and, and the Signal breach? So as some of you may know, uh, Twilio has had more than about 150,000 corporate customers, including Facebook and Uber. And they have they haven't really identified the threat actor, but he did convince multiple Twilio employees into simply handing over their credentials, uh, which allowed them to more or less access the company's internal systems. This was a one-on-one -on -one hack. There was no effort really. There was no exploit. It was just pure social engineering. And unfortunately, uh, the attack used SMS phishing that perpetrated that it came from Twilio's IT department. So it was a little bit on the creative side. It suggested that the employee's passwords 
had expired and that they should be changed. So they clicked on the link and they put in the old password and they put in the new password. And basically Twilio said the attacker's messages looked legitimate. Uh, they included words such as OKTA, Okta, which is known for their single sign-on operators. Uh, they also included the word SSO, for example, and unfortunately, this is something that we still haven't mastered how to avoid phishing. Okay, so there wasn't anything exploitable this time around. It was exploiting humans. And there's no patch for people yet. Microsoft's working on one, I think. Yeah, probably. But essentially, that's the summary of what took place at Twilio. And it was classic social engineering, bait and hook. And they got quite a few goodies from there. Did, was it just Signal that came out? uh publicly did uh, there was, was there any other company names that came out of this whole thing or just signal i saw signal made the release i'm not sure if the other companies are enough equipped to give the forensics reports yet so they're probably working on that and then they'll be doing the reports as well but i've only heard of signal reporting out so far just a curiosity question with the uh, with the uh phishing uh, exploit Obviously, we we know what was released, but do they do that through uh, through email? What how did what do they attack in order to it was, do this? It was text messages. It was SMS. Oh, SMS. Uh, okay. And the funny thing is, Twilio didn't mention if the attacker encountered any multi-factor authentication to gain access to the technology. So okay. this is the, the strange part, and this is where it becomes interesting because. If you've been, if you just have a single asset that doesn't have the MFA, then they're in. And this is the issue is that as soon as they get their phishing campaign started, they're not just fishing in the dark. They know what kind of fish they're looking for. And they know exactly where they're going to put in those credentials. So it's interesting to see technologies from 12 years ago, still not enabled and tactics from almost when social engineering started are still prevailing. Uh, bypassing an antivirus and a firewall, it's IDS, it's IPS. Uh, it's unbelievable that in 2022, this is what makes headlines phishing. Being a, being a signal user myself, that's the part that that affects me uh, the most, right? You never like to, to be, uh, li- I'm talking personally here, uh, linked to any type of breach. Uh, but you see, it's oftentimes I notice that you know, a company gets hacked and it's not necessarily that company that is at the forefront of being in like uh, in the news. It's the more well-known uh, outfits that kind of get splashed. You know, the reputation gets gets dirty because of someone else. And, and that's always uh, that's always a shame. Uh, OK, uh, so that's good info on that breach. Um, I wanted to move on and talk about something else. Uh, which was actually a, a big event that happened. It was the 25th anniversary of a huge conference. And you've probably guessed it, uh, Black Hat, the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas was the 25th anniversary. Uh, it, it's making me feel a bit old there, but uh, yet here, here we are, Bill. You were at the show, you attended the show. Uh, can you give us a little sense of what you saw, what you heard? Absolutely. So um, maybe just in case anyone doesn't know what the Black Hat Conference is, I'll just give a high level overview. Uh, The conference was started by Jeff Moss 25 years ago with the intent of informing, for lack of a better word, more more corporate security individuals, what what the Black Hats are actually doing out there in the wild. So we can actually start to uh, learn directly from the adversary a little bit and uh, see what we should be doing as security practitioners um, to secure our hosts, our systems, our networks, our individual devices, whatever it might happen to be. Um, This year, they had 111 different countries represent, so the attendance was strong. And I gotta say, this is the first conference I've been to post-COVID where it was back. I mean, there were people all over the place. It was a fantastic conference. Oh, absolutely. Really good to be there. It was just good to see everybody. Um, and I think everybody that, uh, you know, from a community perspective that, uh, that I'm associated with is represented. It's not every individual person, but almost every partner that we have, many clients, uh, et cetera, that were there. Okay, great. Show. 
great. Glad to hear that the pandemic slowly fading away for the trade show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. In, from, from a high-level perspective, um, if you were to attend, what, what should you expect? Uh, again, community, I think, is a strong part of Black Hat. Um, but the, the conversations that you hear at Black Hat are unlike most that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, day-to-day -day we hear about individual topics that that we're all used to, to hearing about, and you still hear about them there, like ransomware, uh, still a major problem, uh, various exploits and so on. But uh, the things that I really liked about this year's conversation were some unique concepts that I never really even thought about. Uh, for example, in the, in the keynote presentation, uh, actually prior to the keynote, Jeff Moss in his introduction talked about this concept uh, called, I want to make sure I get it right, um, the super empowered individuals or groups that, uh, that have the capabilities to potentially control who they do business with, who has access to what, uh, what countries we are now supporting or not supporting, um, and so on. So that was a, a new concept kind of driven out of uh, the Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflicts of determining how do we turn on or off access to large groups of people or groups um, based upon your individual powers or your company's power and capabilities. So that was a, a unique uh, concept that I really hadn't given any thought to before. And uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting to hear Jeff Moss talk about that. Um, uh, Chris Krebs actually gave the, um, the keynote. Um, so he, he asked us three questions. Why is it so bad right now? Why is it going to get worse? And what are we going to do about it? Uh, I don't think I can cover that in my three minutes to go over everything that he discussed. Uh, but I do think that there were a couple of things that I thought were pretty, pretty interesting to, to think about. Um, and I think I'll probably focus on why is it so bad and why is it going to get worse? And yeah. what we'll about it might take some time, but. He talked about how the, I'm paraphrasing greatly, but the proliferation of devices and data, how we continuously make our environments more and more complex. Uh, and as a result of the complexities that we add, we've kind of become accustomed to having insecure systems or not demanding security by default. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we, we are sharing data, we're using data on systems that by themselves are not inherently secure because, frankly, cost, the cost to make a very secure system, uh, the benefits don't outweigh the, uh, the cost at the moment. So those are some of the things that uh, Chris Krebs talked about. Um, being from CISA, it's not a big surprise. He talked about the public-private relationship. Mm -hmm. things uh, should become more consolidated. And what I did like about the public-private collaboration and, and the, uh, the concepts that he talked about were rather than adding more regulations, we need to start demanding outcome-based approaches to information security uh, or, or secure systems um, and so on. And, and then uh, kind of moving past that, well, I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions or comments. But... I was going to say, it's like the people are still complacent. They're, the pain is not, the pain is not sharp enough. Like, I mean, we, they don't demand those, that secure system yet. There are companies and people are still willing to, to, to take the hits. He talked about, for example, just as a, a, an example, the aura ring, you know, not saying that it's not secure. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we, we see the benefits of being able to uh, sleep track, you know, we're a sleep tracker and say, all right, what is, what is the information that I'm collecting and what are the unintended consequences of sharing that data and is it secure? As consumers, we assume a high level of security should be built into the product. And, and as, as technical individuals, we all know that that's not always the case. Um, so how do we continue to, to put more demands on people who create products or services to make them secure um, inherently? Tim, did you have any, 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 any questions to add to that or are you good? I don't have any questions, but I, but I think that it, it's a lot to think about, right? Even going back to the kind of the, the Twilio thing when we said, you know, how are we still here? Right. And, and 
that kind of bleeds into the the message of of what um, you know Bill just said about black hat. Right? Is it still? Why are we still here? Is it complacency? You know, there seems exactly. there seems to be a disconnect of you know even I'm guilty of this. Like as a consumer, sometimes you're like, ah, it's secure. You know, my Apple Watch, my my thermostat, um, uh, my Roku devices, like it's all secure. And then on the flip side, because, you know, we all work in technology, uh, we know that that is a faulty assumption because we all work. Um, there's just no way to be 100 percent secure. We secure with um, products that are developed and, and aren't perfect. So there seems to be um, still kind of a, a disconnect. And then you add a complicating factor to that, where, which uh, is um, we tend to pass legislation that um, is is passed by people who don't understand technology. So it doesn't really help that much. Right. So I like the idea of the outcome based approach rather than, you know, uh, some of the regulations we've seen where you're like, all right, how does this apply? Like, like this doesn't really make any sense. I think there was one that just was passed um, by the, was it the, one of the, was it the DOD or somebody that just um, had uh, said that, you know, from now on you can have zero vulnerabilities um, in your, um, in your, in your applications, you know, no, they didn't qualify it with critical high, uh, nothing. It was just like, you, no, in order to, to pass this. Yeah, it, they did. Right. And so, uh, you're sitting there going, was that the best approach? So, um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, I think we're trying to solve it. I think that's kind of for, to some extent, what zero trust is attempting to do, whether it does it or not is probably a discussion for another podcast, but like, you know, trying to, trying to, to piece all this together. So we assume that nothing is trusted. Um, it's probably trying to help that. Um, a lot of it kind of similarly to a lot of the things you're seeing happening around third party security with S bombs these days, the focus on AppSec and cloud security. I think we're trying, but I still think we're, we're finding our, our way. I mean, that's kind of the conglomeration of both topics together in my head anyway. Do you need to report a cyber threat? Virtual Guardian's emergency response team can take immediate action. Responding and recovery are vital to ensure your business critical services are maintained. Visit virtualguardian.com and click on report a cyber threat in the upper right hand corner or call us at 1-800-401-TECH. That's 1-800-401-8324. And Chris mentioned uh, in his presentation as well that we we, we need leaders who, who actually both within government and in the private sector that really understand security uh, because without without those types of leaders we're we're not going to get close to uh, addressing the problem with any meaningful consequence and meanwhile and with all this turmoil of course the bad guys use it uh, to get into every nook and cranny and uh, and exploit every which way because there's all this turmoil, all this instability, all this new stuff, all these mach- all these systems, and uh, yeah, no, no surprise that uh, that we have all these breaches and all the, these kinds of bad things happening, right? Yeah, well, and Marco, to your point on the nooks and crannies and all these uh, different areas, I mean, I think that was maybe the the strongest impression that I shared with uh, with a colleague at the event is, you know, it's great that we're finding security solutions to some of the problems that exist out there. And there is no shortage of people looking for more ways to secure more things. I mean, the trade show floor, it's its a huge trade show and there are booths all over the place, up and down, and, and everyone's trying to get your attention. And I think that is, um, that might be more one of the, more than one of the impress, impressive parts of the show, as well as more of the, from a consumer's perspective, frustrating parts. Now, how do I evaluate what do I really, really need? And I think uh, I think some of the thoughts I had come back to the uh, old school thoughts of you know what is your attack surface? Uh, how do you do threat modeling? Some of the some of the components that um, I'm not saying anyone's forgotten, but they need to be re reinvested in in many organizations to say what do we have? How do we secure it? What are the potential impacts and so on? Um, and there's not a shortage of, of, uh, of companies out there trying to figure that out for you, but until you know what you have, what's important to you, what needs to be protected, um, it's just a lot of noise. That's something that I took away that I, that I constantly take away. I talk to a lot of, of, um, 
security leaders, right? And and I think um, what you said is it, well, there's so many vendors out there. We've probably all seen that Optive chart of security vendors everywhere, hundreds of them. How do you weed through all that to know what is actually going to work and how are you going to protect your attack service, right? And who's your tr- and if you don't know how to do it, like who's your trusted partner um, that can help, right? And, and to figure out exactly what you need to do um, to, to, to secure. I think that's one of the, the struggles um, because we have the security industry is so overwhelmed with, um, with, with uh, a need that sometimes the people who are leading security are semi new to leading security, right? And so they get they get overwhelmed when they when they when they take over. So that's that's kind of an additional problem um, that I always take away from when I go to the trade floor. Would you say, uh, Bill, that uh, well, this prolifer- proliferation sorry proliferation of uh, of vendors uh, that's kind of one of the trends that you notice? Did you notice any? Is that uh, what we're seeing there? Uh, like a a general uh, trend. Trending topic yeah, it, there at Black Hat? It's, it's a trend and a topic, but it's not necessarily something that I saw wrong. I mean, um, mm. you know, we saw a great demonstration from uh, from a company that all they focus on is understanding how to identify as well as prevent attacks to artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. Mm-hmm. Um, so many companies are investing in AI and ML. Mm-hmm. Great. How do you know someone's tampering with that data set? They're focusing on it. So the it's a good news, bad news. Um, as we continue to expand on our uh, our technology and, and those complexities that's previously discussed, we are going to have to figure out ways to uh, continuously add security to those particular areas. Yeah, absolutely. It's an expansion of the attack surface, as previously mentioned as well. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Anything to add, guys? Yeah, what I just wanted to add what a, what a lot of people misunderstand about these threat actors is that they're one of the most organized entities in the world and they are not up to date longer than about 5 minutes ago. Okay, they have global scans of the entire world happening around the clock. They know every version. They know every upgrade, every update, every IP, every little nick and cranny of the world is laid out for these people. And at the drop of an exploit, it's fairly easy for them to be the first hitters. They're the first responders, technically, right? They're responding to the availability of the exploit, then they're exploiting it, and then they're cashing out or doing whatever. You have to understand the level of sophistication this takes. Okay, these aren't just punks. These aren't losers. These aren't uh, disgruntled people. These are brilliant. Yeah, these are brilliant organizations that that are doing all this at no cost. And this is something I've said for a long time that cybersecurity isn't something you could throw money at. Money will not make this problem go away. Just like money will not make your ransomware go away all the time. You could pay it. it doesn't mean they're gonna give you your keys back, right? And this is something that the world needs to understand that they're surveillance is 24 hours. Why isn't yours? Right? Why isn't your median time to detection the same as their median time to being alerted that there's an exploit? As soon as an exploit hits the market, they get an email, they get a text, they get a tweet, they get something. And there's an immediate playbook to put that exploit into order. Companies should start looking at the same business models that hackers are employing to stay successful because their business plans seem to be working just fine. Absolutely. And on that topic, Christos, I know that uh, we have a few minutes before uh, the spotlight talk, but uh, you have noticed uh, or noticed it was in the news. There were several breaches, uh, namely in Canada 
in the past few weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah. So the first breach was from the RCMP. Uh, the RCMP has used spyware um, on Canadian cellular phones as far back as 2002 to bypass encryption. So this was the first breach on Canadians by a Canadian government entity. Um, the second breach that, well, th there's a handful of them, right? So Lockbit uh, took two new clients um, on the 6th of August. It got New West Metals. It's a Canadian metal company. Uh, they've been in business for over 38 years, distributor of specialty metals across Canada. Uh, they also got the town of St. Mary in Ontario. Uh, this happened on the 7th, uh, July 25th. Okay. And these were both ransomware lock bits. There's also a, a hacker named Black Basta that seems to be making his rounds around Canada. Uh, he got Group JF's Nado Incorporated not ransomware, exfiltrated all their data. Just, that's, a Quebec, that's a Quebec company. That's, that's a, a Quebec company. company, yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. also got Black Basta that did uh, Canarapa Montreal, uh, which is a leading contract manufacturer, importer, distributor of quality commercial residential architectural door hardware. I'm not sure why in particular they're going after uh, these kinds of targets, but I do have a theory. Uh, there's also Trademark Industrial uh, from Cambridge, Ontario, and uh, one that some local people on the call might know, Olympia Tile, also got breached. So if you ever purchased anything from them, you know, your, <laughs> your info's out. But there's an interesting one that came out on Friday. It was last Friday. Um, it was on a forum, it was on a forum, and basically, what this guy his his full his full hacker name is Fools Fools House. He says, "Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to offer you the following lot: a hundred Canada profiles leaked from financial services loan credit application. Each profile contains basic information such as social insurance, date of birth, name, and address." The initial price is $500 and it's open for bid for 24 hours, right? So somebody won the bid, got that information. And this, this is interesting. This is interesting because he's actually selling loan credit applications. Yeah. That, means that, that, that means that somebody received an email saying, we're approving you for this line of credit fill out this application, send it back to us. And they put a little logo of a bank and, and then they receive it back. Then they receive it back. And this guy got a hundred of them in a week. So it's clear, it's clear, it's clear, 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 clear that not only, not only are little companies being breached, okay? There's big companies being breached also. Um, let me I notice that uh, Christos, yeah, Olympia Tile Industrial, <laughs> the metal one, industrial, yeah. Yeah. the door, the door manufacturer, industrial. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm uh, just off the top of my head, it seems like there's like kind of a trend there. There is, uh, a, listen, there is listen, a... Christos, 30 seconds, please. We gotta move on. So, if you can close it, oh, well, essentially, whatever we have been doing for cybersecurity up until now still needs some work. Yeah. The world still needs those infomercials they used to show to kids to not put things in their mouth and to not light forest fires. I think they need to bring these back for everybody and start kind of making an awareness campaign, just like they did with the Children's Youth Foundation. They need this for the rest of us now, because getting getting an $150,000 lien against your credit that you're not responsible for, I can guarantee you those 100 people that were sold in the Canadian bid, their lives are going to be ruined for a long, long time. Those are real people. Those are real sales. Okay? Absolutely. Keep your eyes open, guys. Are you enjoying Behind the Shield? Enjoy it more without commercials. Watch us live without interruption by registering for our virtual event each month. Visit virtualguardian.com slash event and check out what's planned for the next Behind the Shield. Remember, when you're behind the shield, you're ahead of the game. 
Thank you, Christos. Great, good stuff. Tim, Bill, thank you for your insights on the hot topics. Very interesting uh, stuff. Some, some encouraging, some less encouraging. Uh, but let's move on. We have to move on to the, the spotlight talk. So, um, Tim, uh, we're going we're gonna to turn it over to you. So, Tim Chase of Lacework. Uh, Lacework is a cloud security service provider that aut automates cloud security at scale so customers can innovate with speed and safety. Uh, a little bit of background on Tim. Uh, he's been working in information security for 15 years in many different roles, including leading security teams focusing on cloud and AppSec. He has extensive experience working uh, at the board and executive levels to promote security and guide decision-making. Over the last few years, he has been focusing his efforts on DevSecOps and the intersection of AppSec, DevOps, and cloud. In addition, he is a LinkedIn training author where he has uh, been training to help build DevSecOps into the development pipeline. He is currently field CISO at Lacework, and his talk today is titled, Secure Your Cloud, the first easy steps. So Tim, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Always awesome hearing your bio. Hope you live up to it here. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes um, on um, securing your cloud. And it kind of goes to, I guess, one of the comments that uh, maybe was just kind of sitting in the back of my head uh, when we were talking earlier when, when I said, sometimes it's hard to know where to start, right? You've got so much stuff thrown at you, um, and, uh, sometimes you just don't know how to, to, to get started. And so you kind of struggle and maybe you do nothing or maybe you try and do too much. And so what I just wanted to talk about today for a little bit was just, you know, what are some first easy steps to getting, um, your cloud secure? And so, um, so, so just to kind of talk, you know, briefly about the, the why, like, why do companies use the cloud? Um, and not everyone uses the cloud for the same reasons, but these are just a few things that I hear um, when, I, when I talk with um, leaders. Um, speed, people, you know, speed is kind of uh, money these days. People want to move faster. And since uh, one person can move faster, it's kind of expected that everybody can move fast. And so um, in order to make sales better, people push, to push product better, um, people have to move fast. Uh, no data centers. It, more and more people are wanting to move out of the data center business. Um, you know, that used to be everybody would have, you know, at least two data centers uh, for redundancy and they'd have, uh, have to manage all the racks of their servers. And uh, I think a lot of people are just over having to do that. Right. And they want to find a way to um, make it easier. And, and, and obviously the reason, you know, why are people over the data centers? Why is, uh, why are so many people moving away? Well, you know, one of them is cost, right? Having to um, purchase all of these servers that sit um, in racks and having to pay someone to go maintain them and pay someone to pay for the, the rack space in these data centers, right? That can, that can be costly over time, and it, including the people that you have to pay, um, you know, who, who are um, network specialists and all this kind of stuff. So maybe they want to move away from that and, and try and save some money, but also flexibility. If you think about it, one of the, one of the pain points um, going back as far as I can remember is that you've got um, all of this capacity that may just sit uh, idle for a lot of the time. You know, if you're a, um, you know, if you're a, a tax, uh, tax company, right. And, and so like here in the States, you know, usually between February and April is going to be your busiest time of the year. But if you were in a data center, that's what you'd have to plan for from a capacity perspective. Well, that's expensive. If you only need, you know, all of these servers for three months out of the year and the rest of the time, they're just sitting mostly idle. That's just wasted money and wasted time and cycles. Right. And so people want to move to a system where they've got more flexibility. Um, so, but when you start to look on how to secure the cloud, I think that that becomes more challenging. Right. And this is one of the things that we've been trying to solve for a while. And I've been, I've been doing cloud security now, I think for about 10 years, something like that. Um, and, and a lot of times we try and do it the same way, but you know, why is cloud security um, uh, difficult, right? So just these are just a few of the bullet points, right? Um, because compliance in the cloud can be tedious, right? It can be difficult to achieve your, your ISO or your SOC because 
Um, sometimes you don't know what infrastructure you have, or maybe your auditors aren't as cloud savvy as they need to be. And so they're trying to force an on-prem compliance um, framework into a cloud, right? Um, also uh, more data and more visibility and gaps, right? So the, that's one of the things about the cloud is the amount of data that you have there just has, is exponentially larger. So how do, you, how do you keep up with that? And how do you sort through all that data to know how to secure it? Um, we see more, more rules and more noise, right? So when you start looking at how to, uh, doing security in the cloud, a lot of times um, the way the, the tools that are there natively or some of the existing tools, um, they make a lot of noise. And so you have to find a way to um, sort through all that, sort through your cloud trail, sort through all of your alerts to find out what you have to fix and when, right? Um, and so all of that, and on top of that, we talked about speed, right? So all of this stuff that's happening rapidly. And by the time, you know, we finish this podcast, um, you know, here, somebody could have spun up, you know, hundreds of servers, right? And how do you secure that, right? In the, in the old way of doing things, you'd have plenty of time where, you have change requests that forms that filled out the rack and stack. You can you'll have time to, to determine what you have to do to secure the server. But, you know, how do you secure hundreds of servers in the matter you know, of an hour? And they could go up and down. Right. And so uh, it, it's hard because of speed. Right. And, and typically with cloud comes the move to DevOps. Those two things don't have to go together. But most of the time you'll see those two things go together. And the entire point of DevOps is to take your, your operations team, your development team and mix them. So you don't have this dedicated team over here that just manages servers and this team over here that, that develops, they merge. And so people want to push things to production quicker, which means that you have to figure out how to secure the cloud quicker, right? Shadow IT, that's another one of the ways, right? So it's hard to keep track of who is in what cloud and what they've done in the cloud, right? Shadow IT has always been somewhat of a problem. You know, somebody would go spin up a server on, on Rackspace or something in the past and you wouldn't know about it. But in the cloud, you know, anybody could spin up um, an infrastructure that maybe they have access to, or maybe they put it on their credit card for a little bit of time, right? So, so cloud security can be hard because sometimes you don't know what you have out there. And then cloud is different. I can't tell you the number of times that I've gotten on a call and people are trying to take what they've done on-prem and make it work um, in the cloud, whether that's you know taking firewalls and putting them up there, uh, taking um, network monitoring solutions and, and throwing them up there. And, and kudos to those providers that, that sell that because it's, it's still sold, but does that really work at scale? Can you take the old way of securing data centers and throw it in the cloud? I would suggest no. Um, cloud is different, right? Just, just the very nature of what the cloud providers abstract versus what you're responsible for, um, cloud security is different. And then, like I said, massive amounts of data, right? So you, when you start looking at all the log that you can collect inside of the cloud, whether that's your cloud logs themselves or whether it's um, uh, logs from your, your servers, your um, containers, whatever it happens to be, it's a massive amount of data. So how do you sort through all that data and get meaningful um, information back? So. So I say all that to say, like, where do you start, right? So what I do is I, this is kind of my solution of, of, of doing it. I've done it a few times. I say divide it into pieces, right? I call it maybe like a pragmatic approach, but don't, I hate the phrase a little bit, but don't try and eat the, the elephant all at once, right? Like, because um, if you do that and you try and say, oh crap, like I've got to go to cloud, I've got to, I've got to fix my, my uh, compliance problems, my container, my workloads, I've got to know what's going on in my cloud. Like, you'll get overwhelmed really quickly and you'll end up probably doing the wrong thing or just doing something and sending it over to everybody else to fix and nothing will happen. So what I suggest people do is take it step by step, right? Take, take it one step at a time. And I've kind of laid out here um, just, you know, three steps that I would take to kind of get started. Right. So posture management and compliance. The first step is just let's know what we have out there. Right. Let's find a way to measure what our cloud security posture is. And just see, are we doing anything? Uh, do we have any gaps? Like, are we, do we have ports open that maybe we don't know about? Do we have protocols that are exposed? You know, are we exposing port 22 to the entire world, right? Then maybe we act, somebody accidentally did that. And, and uh, is that a problem? How about MFA? Like, do we have, do our users have MFA enabled? There's that a gap, right? Just having a way to, to scan your cloud um, um, infrastructure. And, and do it in a way that um, can provide you that valuable data, that's a good way to start. And then you can measure against something, right? So um, maybe measure against um, uh, a compliance um, just to start with. So 
you could do something along the lines of CIS benchmarks, right? Say, all right, the, my first step is that I'm going to take uh, my cloud environments and I'm going to measure them to the CIS benchmarks. That way I can say, you know, this is what we're tracking to. Um, we don't necessarily have to fix all of the stuff in the, in this, in the posture management finds, but let's conform to the standard benchmarks. And that's something measurable that you could take to your leadership to say, this is what we're conforming. Here's all the work that we have to do. And then, you know, move on from there. So kind of just get a handle on, on your cloud, right? The next thing you can move to maybe is vulnerability management. So, you know, Log4J obviously was, was a big deal, but, but vulnerability management can be a little bit difficult to do. That means you got to know what all of your workloads are um, that are running um, or where your workloads are in your repositories. And you have to be able to scan those, right? Both from an operating system perspective and from, a, um, and from an application perspective, like your jars and your gems and like any of your libraries that you include in your app. So get a handle on vulnerability management next, right? And that's typically what I do for, for step two um, in the cloud. Once you kind of understand your posture, you've gotten that locked down, move to vulnerability management um, and, and work on that. And then the third is monitor for threats, right? So let's see what's going on in our actual production environment. Um, and I know it may, I, I know it may sound silly to, to kind of do monitoring last. Sometimes I go back and forth, but the way that I look at it is like, if you start with monitoring, but you're still wide open, like you're just going to be chasing your tail to some extent. That's why I usually focus on posture first. And then, and then I worry about monitoring because then you're going to be monitoring your um, cloud logs for abnormalities. You'd be run, monitoring your containers for things um, like a container escape or uh, processes running in your containers that shouldn't be or malware, things like that. So let's, let's monitor for threats last to understand kind of what's happening in your production environment. And when you do that alerting, at that point, now that you've got this stuff together, you can start connecting to alert channels, right? And what do I mean by that is... Um, Let's start connecting into Slack, Jira, Teams, whatever you have, and let's start alerting on all of this stuff real time and sending it to the appropriate teams, right? So at this point, you should have kind of a good handle on your CSPM, so your alert levels hopefully are trending down. And then by the time you get to this monitor part, um, you should have enough alerts that your people won't get burnt out and alert fatigue. So focus on understanding what's happening in your production environment and then connect to the alert channels. And then kind of just to you know, finish up and tie it together, um, build it into your pipeline, right? So once you've got kind of those, those silos figured out, you know, the overall trend is, is let's figure out how to shift left, if you will, right? I, that's, that's a little bit of an overused trend, term because you want to have security everywhere. So it's like shift everywhere, but figure out how to build it into your pipeline so that you're scanning your server um, it, at the development level, right? If you're building everything in the cloud and you're using um, infrastructure as code, scan that as early as possible, build it into your pipeline and fail it before it even gets into production if you have issues, right? Um, send it to other teams. So one of the, the core tenets from my perspective is when you're building it into the pipeline, let's not have everybody use the security tool per se. Let's find a way, let's find a way to have them use the tool of their choice. If your developers work in Jira and Slack, then let's take whatever we do and put it in Jira and Slack so that it's more seamless and more DevOpsy. And then always, like I always say, continuously have feedback and improve. So as you're as you're going through here and you're kind of setting this up, find out what works and what doesn't. You know, if you're finding that um, you're getting too many alerts or not enough alerts, like figure out what's going on and always look to do better, right? To evaluate your tools, evaluate your processes and kind of always have that, that consistent feedback. And then at the very end, um, I did not, there we go. At the very end, you know, you would want, you'd want it to look something like this, right? Where you've got all of your, um, all of your cloud providers. Cause we all know that nobody sticks with one, right? Everybody has to go multi-cloud um, monitor by a cloud security platform, um, those connect in with the automation pipelines, hopefully, so that you can build that into the runtime. Um, and then those would push out to like your alerting, your SIM and your things like that. Right. So ultimately, this is kind of what you would want out of your cloud security platform where everything is kind of interconnected. You have something managing your cloud security um, that feeds uh, to your other systems that may be your operations team or your developers um, work in. And that's my my easy kind of first steps to, to cloud security guy there. 
Are you struggling with the agility required to keep up with today's security threats? Are you wondering how you can empower teams to be most effective and what obstacles you have to securely remove to do so? Solsys is the trusted advisor you've been looking for. We're a leading security products and services provider that leverages agile methods to support. We build great product teams, combining agile methods with security expertise to offer unique business value for your enterprise. To learn more how we can deliver faster and better value to customers, contact us at info at solstice.ca and check out our website at solstice.ca. Great stuff, Tim. Great stuff. I have so many questions. I'm sure other people have some questions too. Uh, I guess off the top of my head, uh, one of the last things that you mentioned really quickly there when you showed that graphic, um, you said that uh, I guess people don't want to put all their eggs in the same basket and they use different uh, cloud providers. So I guess people want to go with uh, Azure and uh, half Azure and half AWS, for example. So how are you supposed to keep an eye on, you know, if you have stuff on in different clouds, well, how do you build that into your strategy? Absolutely. I, I always say you always end up with, with multi-cloud because it's not, it's not my choice. It's not the CISO's choice. Um, the security team's choice. It's always a business choice for some reason, right? Nobody ever consults us. They just come to after the fact and tell us to secure it, right? That's just the nature of it, right? Mm-hmm. And so we, most companies will end up being multi-cloud at, at some point. And so what you have to do is you just have to make sure that whatever process that you set out, whatever tools you use, have the ability to support that, right? Because if you think about it, um, if you're in three cloud, it's not unusual for me to, to run across people that are in all three clouds. If your security team is managing um, the security tools of three different cloud providers that that can be a little bit difficult. So just try it. Whatever you use, find something that can can monitor um, and, and support um, those cloud providers. Right. So that, that's the best thing that you can do is not get yourself locked into one from a security perspective. And always, and say you do say that you um, say that we, what you build out is AWS centric because at the time. Like um, everything is in AWS. And then later on, you find out that the company is going to do some stuff in GCP too. That's part of the feedback. You'll be like, all right, like which parts of this will work in GCP, which ones won't. And then you'll just, you'll just constantly come in and, and reevaluate what you're doing. Never get, never get locked in. Um, is is kind of what I say. Okay. Gotcha. And um, I, I, you know, I don't really want to get into the tools and, and technicalities and stuff like that, but when you're spinning up servers, and spinning up, uh, you know, it, it's from one day to the next, your, your environment is never the same. Ooh, how do you keep a grasp on, uh, let, let's just say, one of those three pillars that you were talking about, the vulnerability management, for example, okay, the, middle, the middle box there in one of your slides. Uh, if you're spinning up servers, spinning down servers, and one day you have and one day you don't, how can you keep tabs on all those, like on the vulnerabilities, for example? Yeah, I think I think that gets I think it gets tough because to some extent, um, sometimes if, if you have a a transient cloud environment um, or that gets spun up and spun spun down, whether it's just because of the nature of how you process, maybe it's the time of year or things like that, it can be tough because by the time you get around to fixing it, maybe it's gone, right? It doesn't mean you weren't exposed; you were exposed for that time because, like um, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. Chris mentioned at the end. Scanning is always happening. Why aren't you there to, to fast enough to fix it? So That's a couple right. of things. One is make sure, you know, eventually you have to be fast. So when you're in your ideal state, you'll be able to respond fairly quickly to a vulnerability. But the, but the real key from my perspective is, is kind of when we talked about the shifting of the left, right? Make sure that whatever you do is scanned in development. So when you're talking about shifting up, um, uh, you know, servers that already have vulnerabilities. My question would be is, why are you spinning up servers that have vulnerabilities? Did you not connect to your repo and run the, the scan against the, uh, the Terraform? Or did you not run the scan inside of, against the Docker image to look for vulnerabilities, right? So that would be my question. Is it like, rather than focusing that we should be able to respond to it and be alerted at the, for those servers that maybe are only there for an hour or two, but, you're, but you should have it better in your pipeline. So you're responding to them. Uh, you're, you're not putting out things that have vulnerabilities in the first place. I could respond to, I could respond to that one, Tim, <clears throat> because you're absolutely right. In a perfect world, there's departments and there's people that work in those departments. As we know, <clears throat> unfortunately, 
a lot of the companies, startups, as well as the successful ones, they're always looking to minimize things and to save money, right? And what happens is that you start off your job by wearing just one hat, right? You're just the IT person responsible for changing passwords. And that's your only responsibility. And by the end of the year, you're wearing the firewall hat and you're wearing the cloud hat and you're wearing the infrastructure hat because you knew how to do it and you volunteered your time to do it. And all of a sudden you're wearing 12 different hats, right? What happens is that things start to get a little bit mixed up as far as procedures and policies are concerned, because the guy spinning up that Amazon cloud server is also the guy responsible for securing it, but he knows better. So he's not going to secure it and he's just going to spin it up. And there it is. And then Monday morning you show up to work and somebody else is running the company. Right. And this is, this is the difference between best practice and policies versus uh, real snapshots of what companies are going through. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Bill, anything to add on, on, uh, on this? Are you good or? I'm, I'm good. I did like the, uh, the use of the CIS benchmarks. I think that's uh, a good starting point. Um, uh, and based on limited time, I'll just say I really appreciate them. Good, good presentation. Thank you. Tim, uh, what do you think about, um, um, or, or how, I guess rather would be the question is, how do you fit in containers in your strategy and in your, your cloud security strategy? I mean, that's got to be a headache, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think you fit it in, um, obviously, a couple of different places. I think uh, it fits in at the vulnerability level, obviously, because that's where your vulnerabilities are going to lie. But I think you also have to understand it fits in at the at the runtime level. Because I think it's super important to know what your containers are doing, right? Not just sitting there monitoring for somebody to, to drop a virus on there, right? But I think you need to be monitoring, you know, what is the normal activity that your containers are doing and, and monitor and monitor that. Because I, if you think about it, for the most part, containers do the same thing every single time, or even servers in general. They don't, they don't deviate a ton. They should not. Um, and so like you should be monitoring, uh, your container. So it kind of fits into the strategy that I outlay out live, um, on the vulnerability side, but also on the runtime, because you need to understand what's happening inside your cloud environment, like at an API level, but also what's, what's happening um, with your containers um, at runtime as well. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, we're coming up on the hour. There's about uh, a few minutes left. I'm going to see, let me double check. The Q and A. There's a couple of questions that were uh, went back and forth throughout the show. Um, if there are any last questions for Tim, now now would be the chance. If not, we're going to close this baby out. <laughs> All right. Very good. So um, that was great. I want to uh, thank you, gentlemen, Tim, Crystals, Bill. Uh, that was really, really good. Really, uh, it's a fun time. Uh, f I love spending this hour once a month uh, with guys like you just talking about cybersecurity. Um, I hope that um, you out there, the audience, you thought that this information was pertinent uh, and interesting and that we'll see you on a recurring basis. That's our goal here. We want to see you month to month just to, just to talk cybersecurity um, and, and ask questions and just look into you know, some of the things that um, that keep us busy in our day jobs, right? If any of you missed any part of today's show, um, this will be, as I mentioned, we are now a podcast. So uh, you can find us wherever quality podcasts are sold, I guess. Um, so it's going to be on a podcast sometime next week. All right. So before uh, we sign off, I want to formally thank Tim Chase, Crystal Simotas, Bill Stroop uh, for all their insight uh, and their information. That was great. I hope that everybody had a good time. And uh, remember, uh, when you're behind the shield, you're ahead of the game. See you next month.